first hear the theme for the meditation this evening, I'm sure it will sound somewhat strange to you. I have chosen two words from the realm of music, and I want to say just a few words to you in the next few moments on the two words, point and counterpoint. You all recognize the fact that this term has a musical derivation. It means that two or more melodies are running side by side, and that there is a composite melody which gains beauty and power by the recognition of its several elements. Taken alone, each melody is incomplete. It may even be very poor, and thin. But taken together, there is meaning and beauty in the rise and fall of the point and counterpoint, even in momentary dissonance, which is finally resolved into final harmony, and the joint melodies fall sweet and sure on the listening ear. I'm sure that if you have listened so far, you know already what, why this theme was chosen. It's very simple. This is what Christmas has done for life and history and the world. It has introduced another melody into life without which, or without which the discord of history and the broken music of our own lives cannot be understood and possibly not even endured. And I should say to you, particularly my friends who are young tonight, you will not hear all of life's music until you hear beyond the roar and the confusion the little clatter of our hurrying lives, the counterpoint which alone can give them sense and harmony. The new melody which began when the earth was a quiet midnight and the world lay in unquiet sleep, when the almighty word leaped down from heaven. And there was the voice of an angel unto you is born a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And then you will remember there was an interval of silence to enable the audience to reach a stable. And then there was the real theme of the melody, the new song, the eternal counterpoint of the crying of men over their sins, the cry of a child, the whimper of a baby, the voice of a mother. And now, the music of life is really complete. Point and counterpoint. Man and his God become man, singing a new song. Would you like to hear a few measures from this new song, this point in counterpoint, this quiet pre-Christmas night at our vesper. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world, because he was obedient unto death, even the death on the cross, therefore God hath also highly exalted him. This is the new melody. This is point and counterpoint in life and history. And I know of nothing more important to say just tonight. If you want to really understand the basic truth about life and about all of history. Some years ago, Mr. Auden, the English, one of most England's most brilliant poets, suddenly published a work which was quite unexpected from him slowly and quietly 
Mr. Arden had come to the manger, as so many of your and my contemporaries, the modern mind, have come to the valley of disillusionment and despair. And so he wrote a poem which he called for the time being. He called it a Christmas in an oratorio. And at one place, the narrator is a Roman, proud, unaware, living as men live today in a world of headlines, a world secular and half real, listening only to the surface noises of life. And the Roman speaks, and I have often thought that these lines have a strangely modern ring. They could have been said yesterday by one of our world leaders. The Roman says, these are stirring times for the editors of newspapers. History is in the making. Mankind is on the march. The longest aqueduct in the world is already under construction. True, the western seas are still infested with pirates, and the rising power of the barbarian in the north is giving some of us cause for uneasiness. But we are fully alive to these dangers. We are rapidly arming our great empire shall be secure for a thousand years. And at that very moment, when a Roman might have been saying this, at that very moment, Mary was lulling an infant to sleep in a manger, and the shepherds heard her song in the gracious night, and the hands of the child were beginning to tug at that empire, and the melody of Christmas was beginning to sound over the discords of time. Oh, I know, and you know tonight too, and seemingly the world did stumble on nations and armies and cities and navies. But beyond them, somebody ought to say it again this Christmas. Beyond them was now this counterpoint, this power of loneliness and loveliness of faith and of love, of hope, dominating and controlling in the end. The living power of the living God lying helpless and supreme in a manger. I wonder whether you've ever noticed, all of you have ever noticed, that the entire Christmas cycle, everything that is said in the Holy Gospels about Christmas, ends with nine tolling monosyllables which sum up and summarize everything that has happened since that particular time in the history of the world. You remember the lines after Joseph comes back from Egypt? They are dead. They are dead. That sought the young child's life. So they are dead tonight. Hitler and Genghis Khan and Stalin and anybody that seeks the young child's life, whether it be in academic classrooms or out in the battlegrounds of the world, sooner or later the words come true again, they are dead, that sought the young child's life. Now permit me just for a moment to make this as personal as I can. The church wisely makes the season of, of Advent a penitential season. Why? Very simple, isn't it? Because so many things in our lives cannot possibly harmonize with the melody and the song of Christmas. They just strike the wrong note. And so before we can really come to the manger to sing our little carols and to bring our little gifts, there must be a sweeping of the heart a penitential season, a cleansing of the spirit. Except ye become as little children, ye shall also not hear the counterpoint of Christmas. Well, now that is an individual matter here tonight. 
think you can come to the manger with your pride? It won't make any harmony at all. It is bad, it sounds bad, beside the incredible humility of the manger. You think you and I might come with our selfishness? That won't make any melody at all. There'll be no harmony there. Over against the child that gave up the choirs of heaven, the gates in the holy city, for the love of you and me. Come to the manger with our fears and anxieties. They won't fit there either. The melody will not be good enough. The angel said, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings. He came to take our fears and our anxieties into his own hands. Know if there is to be really no disharmony, but real point and counterpoint in our Christmas this year, you and I must come to the very manger, very light and very clean. Past our sins and our hates, our striving and our pushing, our sentimentality and our sophistication, to come at long last to the place where all journeys end, to be with a child born under the floor of the world, lying in a manger so that forever you and I might now look down to heaven, and that we might take our broken songs and our broken hearts and our broken lives and make them new and great with the counterpoint of heaven. To find at the manger the holy grail of a new faith and a new power, that we might live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Certainly, that must be my Christmas wish for you here tonight, especially my students, that you will be quiet so that you may hear only what faith can hear these days. God and man now singing together forever and their song being the ultimate eternal melody of life. To hear that again this Christmas now when you go home, to hear that, I wish you much joy and much glory.